My name's Dave, and I'm going to, over the course of this evening, introduce you to quite a range of other people. Now, some of these people you've never met before, but one of these people ought to be kind of faintly familiar. So, Steve Jobs, unless you've been hiding under a rock for about 20 years, uh, the founder of Apple. Now, Steve famously said that when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is. And your life is just to live your life inside that world and try not to bump into the walls too much. Have fun, have a nice family life, save a bit of money. But he went on to say that maybe that's a very limited kind of life. Maybe you can have a, a broader life if you understand one simple fact. And that fact is that everything around you in what you call the world was made by people no cleverer than you. And once you understand that and you think that you know, you can change it, you can influence it, you can make things that other people will use, actually, you'll never go back. You, you can never turn around from that moment. Now, I wholeheartedly agree with what Steve just said. But, you know, I'm busy. I, I've got things to do. I've got a day job. I'm a husband, I'm a father. I've got to walk the dog twice a day. Sometimes I really ought to go for a run. So, you know, it's great. You know, I, I, could, I could be tearing up all of these unwritten rules. I could be challenging all of these assumptions. But phew, that feels like a lot of work. I've got to find the time somehow. And then, and then I've got to, you know, bring myself to do it. You know, making change, that's, it's, kind of, it's kind of intimidating. Um, well, it was. And then I started talking to people who convinced me that actually maybe changing the world wasn't something that had to be this kind of big change, that I didn't have to tear up the whole rule book all at once. So I need to introduce you to some other people. So this is Alex. He's a graphic designer. This is Holly, and she does charity fundraising. Uh, this is Tim, and he works in professional services. This is Laura, and she's a lawyer. This is Will, and he used to work in software development. Uh, this is Sam, he works for a major international uh, technology firm. Uh, this is George, and he is a creative technologist. And this is Gav, and he's a designer. But that's not the whole story. That's just their day jobs. They all do something else that is changing at least their world, if not a lot of other people's worlds. So let's do this again. So this is Alex. And he publishes a, uh, a physical and a digital magazine that champions independent comics and digital comics. This is Holly, and she writes a fantastic cookery blog. This is Tim, and he runs a website that is devoted to inspiring, advising, and equipping would-be adventurers. And he crowdfunds a grant to support people to go on their adventures. This is Laura, and she runs a cycle touring festival, and she's also involved in a project that gets more um, young people, and particularly women, into adventure cycling. Uh, this is Will, and he is a published children's author. Uh, this is Sam, and he runs a blog dedicated to creative technology and uh, arts and culture, and how those two things interface. George finds and climbs unclimbed mountains. <laughs> largely in Central Asia. Uh, and this is Gav. And he makes films, does animations, gives talks on getting into the creative industries for young people. Uh, he runs a shop with his wife. G Gav is kind of the king of side projects. Um, so all of these people have helped me think that actually maybe I can change the world, but on the side. I can do it part time. And that, that, that feels quite, quite liberating in a way. But, but I, you know, I've still got to, I've still got to do something different, and I've still got to kind of challenge myself to get out of my, my comfort zone, uh, to go and do that. So I need to tell you a little bit more about me. So I, I have a day job. I'm a lecturer in uh, innovation and entrepreneurship at a university. It's my job to help people have ideas, develop those ideas, and try and launch those ideas. There is a problem with that though, and it is that. Entrepreneurship is absolute marmite uh, to the population. Some of my students think this word is wonderful. The idea of being an entrepreneur is fantastic. They're going to change the world. They're going to absolutely embrace Steve's advice. They're going to make things for other people. They're going to go out and do good things and change the world. But other students look at that word and, and they don't quite self-identify with it in the same way. 
that, wow, again, it feels a bit intimidating. Surely entrepreneurship is for people who are, I don't know, more driven, more talented, more creative, more dynamic, better resourced. But, but people are not like me. And people talk themselves out of entrepreneurship quite quickly because they think it's some sort of exclusive club or an elite sport that only certain people can play in. And, I, and that's really worrying. But it's a real obstacle for me and my job in that I can work with some people in my university, but others will hear the E word and run. And, it, and it's not for them, and they want no part of it. So I struggled with this for quite a period of time. And then I read a blog by an entrepreneur uh, called David Hyatt. He was one of the founders of the Howie's clothing brand. And he had this idea of succeeding slowly. How do you nibble away at a project over time? However, however big, however grand that project might be, how do you just kind of pick at it and get towards slow success? Rather than fast failure, which is a bit of an entrepreneurial thing, how do you do, how do, you do slow success? And that idea really resonated to me. And that idea that a side project was a way of referring to this kind of activity, again, really resonated to me and seemed to resonate for lots of the people that I went to speak to. And it transpired that almost everybody I knew had a side project. Everybody had a little hustle. People were, people were making money. People were practicing for a future career that they hadn't had yet. People were doing incredible things that you just could not call a hobby. It, was, it would be rude to call them a hobby. It would be dismissive to call it a hobby. This was, this was kind of powerful, powerful stuff. But they were just succeeding at this kind of slowly. So that, for me, was a breakthrough. And suddenly I could talk to students who would have run away if I'd have kind of badged my session entrepreneurship. But I said, I'm going to kind of help you with your side projects. And they're like, brilliant. I've got this idea I'm going to do this. Or I'm making this thing or I'm crafting this thing. And I could really help. And actually, the people that I was chatting to about this were coming back to me and saying, actually, that was really validating. Like, I had kind of described this as a hobby, but now I can describe it as a venture. I can describe it as a project. And that gave them confidence, and then they could talk to other people about it, and they could find people and meet people, get advice. It seemed to... I'd, I'd changed the language, and I'd changed the rules that suddenly people could look at themselves and they could look at the people around them in really different ways. And for me, I was absolutely dumbstruck by the quality of stuff that my friends were doing that I had no idea that they were because they hadn't talked about it in that way before. Now, some of you may recognise uh, an illustration like this. So this entirely self-drawn diagram um, is, demonstrates all projects ever. But any project can only have two of the three things written at the points of the triangle. So if your project is going to be good and fast, it's going to be expensive. If it's fast and cheap, it's going to be bad. <laughs> Actually, this, this probably applies to more than just projects. This is life, really, isn't it? <laughs> However, if it's good and cheap, then it will be slow. And I think this is what David Hyatt is talking about. That actually, you, you want to do this well. It's something that you care about. But because you've got a day job, because you've got family, you actually you can't invest loads and loads of time in it. It's, it's expensive in time. So actually, you have to resign yourself to the fact that you're going to do it quite slowly. But that's no bad thing. So for me, when I'm talking about side projects, I'm talking about things that are good, but things that are cheap. But they might just have to be slow as a result of that. All of the people that I've shown you, I'm sure, would love to spend more and more time on their projects. But they know that actually there's a real discipline to doing that slow, to doing that on the sidelines. And it means that they're not necessarily kind of rushing things, but they're really working on them over time. And that, I think, makes a difference to the quality. So... I had found something quite interesting here. Now, as an academic, obviously, I thought oh, maybe I need to do some research. And in talking to some of the people that I'd already had a bit of a chat with, we said, well, why don't I start interviewing people about their side projects? So I do. I spend my weekends and evenings interviewing people about their weekends and evenings. My side project has become 
other people side projects, which gets a little bit meta, um, but I'm kind of quite happy with that. So the other thing I had to do, being an academic, was I had to try and draw a diagram. Uh, so my diagram for side projects is just there. <clears throat> Again, apologies for my uh, artistic skills. So I've determined, roughly, and this is a work in progress, that side projects have three key elements. The first of those is passion. You've really got to be into this. You are trying to do this on the sidelines over a long period of time. You are finding little moments in your day to try and spend time on this. You've really got to care about it because you're going to have to be pretty disciplined about seizing all those little moments to make this happen. So Gav, who I mentioned earlier, he gets up two hours early every working day to get his project time in. He is making animations, he's making films, he's working on speeches he's going to give in those two hours before his working day starts. George spends his two weeks annual leave every year going straight out to the former Soviet republics, straight out to the mountains, doing the kind of expeditions that professionals would have taken six weeks to do and acclimatised properly. He's out there two weeks, done it, back again. I mean, that, I mean that's not a holiday anymore, bluntly. So, so passion makes a difference. And if you stop enjoying it, stop it. Actually, if, if you are not getting enough out of it, maybe don't do it anymore. Or if you can't bring yourself to do it, maybe you're not interested enough. The second element is professional competence. Almost everybody depicted here brought some professional skills into their side project. And that's got real value. It means that the project looks a bit slicker, it moves a bit quicker, and it has a bit more credibility to the, the wider audience other than just your, maybe your friends and family, who will always tell you, that's brilliant, keep going. So, for example, Alex can design a beautiful document, which really rather helps when you're trying to make a magazine. Sam knows all about the creative sector, so that really helps when he comes to talk to technologists about creativity and the cultural sector. Everybody is bringing something. Tim is a really credible adventurer. So people are quite willing to listen to, his listen to his advice and take his guidance on what kit to buy. But I also noticed two other things happening. One was that people were often using their professional skills in a more creative manner. That they were using side projects to do what they... wasn't as much fun when they were in, in work, doing it for a client or doing it for their boss, but they were actively, creatively expressing themselves using those professional skills. But the other thing I noticed was that people were also learning new skills. People were using side projects to get better. So Holly could already cook, but what she was doing was learning how to use social media. She took a food photography course to make the blog look even better. So people were actually investing in this. And some of them were using it as a stepping stone to other things in their professional life as well. So the third part here is tomorrow's plan. And this is all about the idea that you are purposefully investing in this being something bigger tomorrow, or it developing you into tomorrow. So whilst people had brought existing skills in, they were, they were learning new things as well. So Gav, was he, his main design work is around kind of graphic design and games design, but he really wants to get into filmmaking and animation. But he has to find a way to prove to his bosses that he knows how to do those things, despite the fact he can't do them in his day job. So he does them in his project time. Sam managed to move out of a job in the creative sector into the technology sector because his blog was all about technology, and he could convince those recruiters that he cared enough. So people were making these stepping stones, and they were getting often unexpected benefits. So Laura uh, does charity law, and she was finding that actually it made her more credible with her clients because she ran a charity herself. So there were some really interesting connections, not necessarily planned connections as to what you wanted to do tomorrow, but things that helped you advance. So these three elements, I think, are really, really critical to making a good side project and lifting it out of what might be a hobby or an amateur activity into something that is really seriously credible. But there is a fourth element that is not on my diagram. And that fourth element separates side projects from successful business ventures. And that item is customers. 
Because if you can do all of that and you can also find a customer who will pay you enough, often enough, to do that thing, you have a business. If you can't find anyone to pay you for it, you have an expensive side project. <laughs> now, I will add one word of warning here. That sometimes when you go looking for customers, you end up walking away from the thing that is actually interested you in the first place. There are plenty of business owners out there, plenty of entrepreneurs out there, who have ended up doing something they're neither very good at or enjoy. But they did find a customer. Now, I'll leave that to you as to whether you think that is a, a situation that you're willing to tolerate. But I painted a bit of a picture. So let's distill some advice out of all of these side projects. If, if I've convinced you that maybe you want to do some side projects, find something that you love to do. Find something that is easier to do than not do. You know, what is genuinely going to get you out of bed in the mornings? What's going to get you spending your weekends and your holidays doing this stuff? Alex was finding time for his magazines during his commute. Holly used her maternity leave to launch the blog and then a second maternity leave to improve the blog. I'm not sure that's the reason for the maternity leave, but um, she used it effectively. You have to make the time. You have to carve it out. You have to get it from all these sort of small places in your life to dedicate enough time to do it. And you have to tell people about it. That really makes the difference. It transforms it. It was when Will, who you saw earlier, told his wife that he had been scribbling on the train, writing things, and she sent him to a writer's group. And only at that point did he take it seriously. And he's now a full-time children's author. Follow the people you admire. Look at who's doing it well. Look at who's doing what you want to do really well and sense check that you want to do it too. And one final insight. Sometimes making that step feels really difficult and you build it up in your mind and it's, you're committing to something. How about actually you've already started it and you started it the first time you had half an idea about it. And by that logic... You've already started dozens and dozens and dozens of things. You've just not finished them. And maybe it's easier to continue something than to start something. So my advice to you is to think, actually, maybe you could be a part-time entrepreneur. Maybe you can rewrite your own rules about who you are, what you do, and what other people think you do. And maybe you can start something amazing as a side project. Thank you very much.